Hello, JBS viewers. I'm David Harris, and this is Defending Israel. Today's format will be a bit different than previous shows or future shows. Uh, I'm here alone. And the reason is really prompted, above all, by that horrendous congressional hearing uh, that we saw with three university presidents testifying. It was a shocking experience for many of us. And according to what I read in the Wall Street Journal, excerpts of that hearing have now been viewed more than one billion with a B times around the world. What was shocking, of course, was the testimonies of the three presidents, what they did say and what they didn't say. And my thanks go to both the Republican and Democratic members of that congressional committee who invited the three presidents to come to speak about anti-Semitism on their campus, to ask tough questions, and in no way to be deferential, even though these presidents represented marquee names in American higher education, Harvard, MIT, and my own alma mater, Penn. It was a sad moment for the three presidents. It was a painful moment for American higher education. And I have to add that the law firm, billed as one of the white shoe law firms in America, Wilmer Hale, who prepared the presidents of Harvard and Penn, uh, <laughs> did not benefit from the experience either. Uh, and I'm glad that the president of Penn uh, resigned afterwards. Uh, I'm glad, though, I understand, having myself served uh, as, a, uh, as a member of a search committee for a previous president of the University of Pennsylvania, that it's an enormously difficult and challenging job to begin with, and that she's paid a very high price. But her, her appearance, uh, her inability to answer basic questions merited the decision to resign, as did the chairman of the board of the university as well. Now, we speak an awful lot these days. We hear a lot about DEI. And I want to revisit DEI for just a second and say that whatever its original intended goals may be, maybe the D, the diversity, also needs to expand a bit to include a diversity of viewpoints uh, on campus and not a monochromatic sort of set of political views, even as universities are searching for different ethnic, uh, religious, and other backgrounds. And how about the E, the equity? Why don't we stop with the first two letters of the word equity, EQ, and ask these and other universities to focus a little more not just on IQ, but how about EQ? EQ in, in terms of sensitivity, in terms of humanity, in terms of understanding of history. And the I, inclusion. Yes, a worthy goal. But we don't need a hierarchy of inclusion in which Jewish and pro-Israel students are somehow at the very bottom of that hierarchy, if they're there at all. And again, that was on display uh, during that congressional testimony. And of course, there's one takeaway word from that testimony as well. It's called context, as if we need to discuss genocide threats against Jews in terms of their context. Well, I want to spend the rest of this show and this conversation between me and you, the JBS viewers, in terms of talking about context, but bigger context, a back to basics. Because what we've seen since October 7th is widespread ignorance, in some cases, widespread malice with respect to Israel, its story, Zionism, Jews, and all of us who support Israel. So let's go back to basics for a moment with one starting theme, peace. For the Jewish people, and yes, now for the state of Israel, peace is not just a slogan that was acquired from a Madison Avenue advertising firm. Peace has been and remains the central objective of the Jewish people for thousands and thousands of years, from then until now. It was not the Madison Avenue law firm 
It was the prophet Isaiah who taught Lo Yisagoi El Goi Chedev, Lo Yilmadu Od Milchama. And nation shall not lift up sword against nation, nor shall they learn war anymore. The prayer that's been recited at every Jewish service, whether Reform, Conservative, Orthodox, Ultra-Orthodox, you name it. Ose shalom bim romav hu yase shalom, aleno via kol Yisrael v'yimru omein. Is a prayer for peace, for peace, for peace for us all. We are taught to be Rodef Shalom, again a name used by many synagogues around the world. The two words meaning a seeker or pursuer of peace. The greeting Shalom is not just hello and goodbye as all of you know I'm sure, but it also means peace because there could be no greater blessing in people encountering other people than peace between them. So, this is not a story about a people who seeks permanent conflict or endless war. This is about a people, our people, who have sought peace since time immemorial. But of course, to have peace requires partners for peace. And that brings me to the second basic issue, history. Now, in today's world, mention the word history, and people either roll their their eyes, or start yawning, or, or run for the hills, especially if it, it's attached to Middle Eastern history, or Arab-Israeli history. Oh, stop, don't bother me with, with all of those old talking points and all. But history matters. How we got here matters. We didn't just arrive here by parachute one day. It matters. The Jewish people, the Jewish people for thousands of years have, if you will, sat on a three-legged stool. One leg is a land. Not just any land. It's not a land called Poland or Brooklyn. It's a land called Israel, Zion. The second leg is a faith. A faith that is inextricably linked to a part of the world. Read any prayer book in any synagogue and the words Zion and Israel and Jerusalem will appear dozens and hundreds of times because we are interwoven with a land, a destination for the Jewish people, a, 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 a geographic and metaphysical center of our identity. And of course, the third leg is a people a people who at one point lived in the land until they were forcibly exiled and expelled, but who never ever lost their connection to the land, the yearning for the land. It's something quite unique, perhaps, um, in the annals of history. At every Passover Seder in every home, you know the words, at least those of you who observe Passover, Lishana Habaa Beirushalayim, next year in Jerusalem. Again, Jerusalem both as a geographic spot on the map, but also as a place in our psyche, in our hearts. We are inextricably linked to that land through our faith, and through our faith to that land. And we, the Jewish people, also recall the Psalms. How about Psalm 137? A psalm, by the way, that President Harry Truman, the president who recognized the reborn state of Israel on May 14, 1948, mentioned as one of his very favorite psalms and one of the inspirations for why he chose to, to veto those in the State Department in Washington who did not want him to recognize the reborn state of Israel. He cited Psalm 137, by the rivers of Babylon, there we sat, yea, we wept when we remembered Zion. This is a psalm not written yesterday, nor when the rock and roll version first appeared in the 1960s or 70s. This again takes us back thousands of years and speaks to this three-legged stool, 
the land, the faith, and the people, and this link between the Jewish people and the land and a faith and a vision that spans thousands of years. But from the year 70 in the Common Era until 1948, the Jews were landless. The Jews were minorities scattered around the world. The Jews were subject to the whim of the rulers, more often than not non-democratic, tyrannical, authoritarian rulers. And the history of anti-Semitism over, over those 1,878 years of landlessness, of lack of sovereignty, speaks for itself. And so when modern Zionism emerged in the late 19th century with names like Herzl and Pinsker and Nordau and others, for them it was a combination of this ancient historical link of a people to a land and a faith, together with the urgent necessity in the late 19th century that Jews would pay an enormous price for continued landlessness. After all, said Herzl, we believed in the promise of Europe after the Enlightenment, when Jews were finally liberated from the ghettos of, of Rome and Venice when the rights of man were promulgated in France and Jews were assured that we would be fully equal citizens with others, only to discover that the promises, whether they were well-intentioned or not, were not well kept. And so they saw this urgent necessity based on the ancient vision and the modern necessity to re return to the land. Now obviously here as we enter the 20th century, this was not an easy proposition in any respect. There were other people also living on the land, not Jews, not Zionists, local Arabs. And so the question became in the 20th century, could you reconcile two national visions, two national aspirations? those of the Jews returning to the land of our ancestral birth and permanent spiritual and religious uh, world. And at the same time, could the local Arab population coexist alongside fulfilling their own aspirations? And so we fast forward to the various attempts. But we begin with a, another key word in any discussion which is too often thrown around irresponsibly these days, legitimacy. Is Israel a legitimate state? Does it even have legitimacy? Or are the efforts to delegitimize the state warranted? Well, I ask you, I ask the world, what exactly are the sources of legitimacy among the 193 member states of the United Nations. Who decided that the European conquest of the United States, of Canada, of Australia, uh, of New Zealand, who decided that that was legitimate? Who decided that the Spanish and Portuguese conquest of so much of Latin America, which resulted in European domination even till this day, of the political and economic elites in those countries is legitimate. Let's keep going. Who decided that the Arab, the Arab invasion, conquest, and occupation of countries across North Africa, including countries like Libya, is legitimate? Why is it that we accept Arab rule across Morocco, Tunisia, Algeria, Libya, and elsewhere, when in fact they are not the indigenous people of the region? And who determined that Jordan, which was called Transjordan one century ago, which was entirely created by London politicians and map makers, is a legitimate state, or Iraq for that matter, while people continue to question to this day Israel's legitimacy? And how about a large country like Pakistan. What exactly is the legitimacy of Pakistan, which again was created in London by those who sought to partition 
the word is important in this conversation, to partition South Asia into India and Pakistan, with Pakistan being seen as a refuge for many Muslims and determined to become a majority Muslim country. So all of that is fine. Pakistan, Jordan, North Africa, the US, Canada, Latin America, Australia, New Zealand, but one country has its legitimacy reviewed and questioned and challenged ad nauseum. Well, by the standards of other countries, Israel's legitimacy goes far deeper. First of all, we have one of the most read books in the history of the world, the Hebrew Bible, which is also a, a, a foundation of the faith of two and a half billion Christians. Uh, the story of the Hebrew Bible, again, does not begin in North America or in Eastern Europe. It, it begins and it stays in that one part of the world that today we call Israel. And then we have to fast forward the Balfour Declaration of 1917. Well, if Britain as a colonial power was qualified to create Pakistan and Jordan, was it not qualified to also create, or at least lay the foundation for Israel? But after the Balfour Declaration, we had additional endorsements, including the League of Nations, which specifically endorsed the Balfour Declaration in giving the mandate to oversee what was called Palestine to Britain for a period of time. The San Remo Conference, the conference of the victors in World War I, also endorsed the Balfour Declaration and the vision of a Jewish national home. And then we fast forward from the 1920s to 1947. And recognizing in this newly formed United Nations that there were still these two national visions uh, within what was then called Mandatory Palestine, and these two visions couldn't be reconciled, they created something called UNSCOP, the United Nations Special Committee on Palestine. And that committee of 11 nations, having reviewed the situation, came back with a majority vote of seven saying, we recommend the establishment of two states, a Jewish state and an Arab state. That recommendation was forwarded to the United Nations General Assembly. And in November 1947, the General Assembly voted. And their vote was 33 nations in favor of the two-state solution, 13 opposed with 10 abstentions. The Jews wanted more than the partition offered. What the Jews were given was small, it was without resources, it would be hard to defend, but the Jews were practical. And they said, yes, a half a loaf for a hungry people is far better than none. And even if it doesn't include Jerusalem, the center of our spiritual and religious aspirations. But the Arab world said no, a flat no. They went to war. Unofficially, they went to war already in 1947. But when Israel was reborn on May 14, 1948, five standing armies declared war on Israel. And the goal? The goal was the annihilation of the new state, nothing less. They failed. But ladies and gentlemen, wars have consequences. You know, when we're children, we often do say in playtime, give me a do-over. In real life, do-overs don't happen. The Arab world said no to a two-state solution. They went to war to annihilate the state of Israel. Israel survived. Uh, Israel, in fact, gained new territory. And Israel remained. And in the course of that war, there were refugees. But again, you won't hear it very often. There were two sets of refugees, not one. There were Arabs who fled the war. And there were Jews from Arab countries who could no longer live in those Arab countries under fear, not just of persecution, but threats of death, pogroms, expulsions. So again, wars have consequences. This was not the first war. Uh, 
Germany declared war. There were tens of millions of refugees as a result. Uh, India and Pakistan had massive exchanges of population. Greece and Turkey had massive exchanges of population. Actions have consequences. Wars have consequences. It's tragic, but again, it didn't have to be. Remember, from the end of that War of Independence until 1967, Gaza, Gaza, the West Bank and Eastern Jerusalem were in Arab hands, not Israeli hands. Where was the effort to establish an independent Palestinian state when the decisions were strictly in the hands of the Arab world? In, in my research efforts, I have found no evidence whatsoever of any attempt to establish an independent Palestinian state in Gaza, the West Bank, and Eastern Jerusalem. Instead, Egypt ruled Gaza with an iron fist. Jordan annexed the West Bank, wanting to make it an integral part of Jordan. And then came 1967, Israel's war for survival. And yes, in that war for survival, Israel gained the West Bank, Eastern Jerusalem, and Gaza and quietly then offered after the war to exchange it land for peace, peace, shalom, the central purpose of the Jewish people. And in Khartoum, Sudan, on September the 1st, 1967, the Arab world said three no's to Israel. No peace, no negotiation, no recognition. Actions have consequences again. There are no do-overs. And then you fast forward to other attempts by Israel, including in 2000 and 2001, joined by President Bill Clinton, in 2008 and 9, joined by the United States, to put far-reaching two-state solutions on the table, only to have them rejected, rejected, out of hand by the Arab side. And then we come to the story of Gaza in particular, which is relevant, obviously, in these moments. Gaza had never, ever been independent. It had never enjoyed local self-rule. The first time it happened was in 2005, when Israel, seeing no partner to achieve a stable peace, uh, chose to leave unilaterally. Go back and view the videos of Israeli soldiers forcibly, forcibly removing thousands of Israeli settlers from Gaza until there was not a single settler, not a single Israeli soldier, no trace of Israel left in Gaza except for the greenhouses that Israel left as a gesture to the local Gazans in an effort to help them start their economy. And Gaza had a choice in 2005 try and follow the model of Singapore and become a thriving, prosperous state, or follow the chaos of countries like Syria and Somalia. And by 2006, Hamas had won elections. By 2007, Hamas was in full control. And for the last 16 years, Hamas has ruled Gaza. Actions have consequences. There are no do-overs. So when people today talk about the occupation of Gaza, by whom? It's by Hamas. Israel had every interest in a thriving, prosperous, peaceful Gaza. It was willing to help. But Hamas had no interest in living alongside Israel. Hamas says it openly. There's no mystery. Hamas says it in its charter, and I urge you, if you haven't, read the Hamas charter. It talks about the eradication of Israel. In fact, it's replete with anti-Semitism as well. Find the Jews between, behind the rocks and the trees, and when you find them, kill them. This is what Israel is up against. This is the context. And when people talk about uh, the suffocation of Gaza, how many people ask, is there one border or are there two borders? There are two borders that Gaza has, and one is with Egypt. So why is Israel solely responsible for what happens in Gaza, 
When Egypt has a border as a fellow Arab nation, a Muslim-majority nation, and yet no one asks why Egypt has closed its border. Well, the answer, I think, is quite simple. Because Hamas represents the jihadist Muslim Brotherhood, which was born in Egypt. And the Egyptians today are as scared of Hamas extremism as Israel is. So, Egypt too has no interest. And why don't people ask, why don't Arab countries accept refugees from Gaza? Indeed, why are there even still refugee camps in Gaza since Israel left 16 years ago? These are the questions that require discussion. But when you go out onto the streets or back to the campuses, including some of the campuses at the congressional hearing, all you hear are slogans. End the occupation. Well, I agree. End the occupation by Hamas since Israel left by 2005. End the suffering of the people of Gaza. Yes, by ensuring that Hamas no longer rules, no longer steals, steals the fuel, the food, uh, the materiel for themselves to pursue the annihilation of Israel rather than the construction of Gaza. Civilian casualties? I couldn't agree more. Any innocent civilian particularly children, should evoke our total sympathy. But Israel faces an enemy, an enemy, that instrumentalizes civilians. Israel exists to defend its civilian population, to defend its hospitals, to defend its houses of worship, to defend its schools and universities from the terrorists. Whereas in Gaza, Hamas uses the hospitals and the mosques and the, and the schools and the residential buildings as the front line of defense in front of, not behind, in front of Hamas. So when we talk about context, yes, there's lots of context, there's lots of historical facts, and I've only scratched the surface on this show. But we need to go back to basics. We need to be confident of our own knowledge. We need to be able to go out there and speak to our neighbors, to our friends, to our children uh, in our workplaces, knowing that the truth, the most powerful weapon of all, is on our side. Israel is a democratic nation. Israel is a nation that seeks peace, not war. Israel is a nation that, when it has had partners, jumped at reaching deals with those partners from Egypt to Jordan to the UAE to Bahrain to Morocco to Sudan and soon I hope there will be others when this current saga is behind us. But we have to go out. So to the presidents of the universities, go learn your history please. Go learn your facts. Get another law firm. Enhance your EQ and not just your IQ. And to JBS viewers, Go forth, we are the front line of the pro-Israel advocacy in the United States. We have a great case to make. Let's go out and make it. I'm David Harris. This is Defending Israel.